Um, Mr. Shlomes. Well, Mr. Nadahodo, an impressive upbeat deduction for a detective racked with loneliness, would you not agree? Was it true what you said about the bank over the road and what it has in its vault? Indeed. Though few you know of its existence, it is one of the government's most closely guarded secrets. Gregson told me, in the strictest confidence. But you just announced it to everyone here. Rather loudly, in fact. Ah. And if it's such a big secret, how would Mr. Benedict have come to find out about it? There can be but one explanation for that. Clearly it is because the man is a criminal. But what if he didn't know anything about the money in the vault? If he's a criminal, as you said, then buying a brand new shovel is sure to be the first thing he does now that you've revealed the secret. Oh. Or if he doesn't, maybe Mr. Windybank will. He already has plenty of shovels here, after all. On oh, my life, I assure you I'm not so unscrupulous. Hmm, well, hopefully this has taught you a valuable lesson. Sensitive information must be handled with the utmost of care. You yeah, don't tell him. One can never be sure that someone privy to secrets won't disclose them. And once the word is out, it's out. Perhaps I'll think twice before confiding in you next time, Mr. Shlomes. An excellent idea, my uh, Mr. Narahodo. Uh, an excellent idea. <laughs> oh dear. Well then, Mr. Narahodo. You know what to do, I'm sure. Yes. Let's listen to the great deduction again and see if we can massage it into shape. There's some very obvious things going on here. But well then, let's just start once more from the beginning. Of Herlock Holmes' magnificent logic and reasoning spectacular. Course correction. Hold it, Mr. Schlames! Mystery man's aim, the tunnel underneath the pawnbrook is. that's not it. First of all, we must ask ourselves on what business you ventured to this pawnbroker today. You claim to have followed the pickpocket here. Having had the redemption ticket stolen from you on the street. But that is most certainly a lie. The real truth is something quite different. As a real buy, that which you hold in your hand. Yes, what brought you to the shop? In the first place is the staff recruitment flyer. Okay. So, by Mr. Schlomes' reasoning, Mr. Benedict came here in order to apply for a job so he could dig around through the floor. Dig through the floor. It's an attempt to tunnel into the sewers to gain access to the money in the vault at the bank across the road. It's like, it's clearly not that, but what is this flyer? But he wouldn't get very far with a broken shovel, would he? No, it's fair to say his motives lie elsewhere. Question is, where? What did bring Mr. Benedict here at this particular point in time? Right, so I want to see, like, what's going on with this, really. certainly is a flyer for Mr. Windybank's shop. Let's see. Windybank, what's you? Pawnbroker's assistant required. It's an eye-catching advertisement, that's for sure. Seen the same flyer up here inside the shop, I think. That's Mr. Windybank is always in need of more staff. So Mr. Benedict came here to apply for a job. That's just too hard to believe. Okay, so what have we got? Uh-huh. I want to know about that. Let's, let's, let's investigate the cane, though. And it's a proper English gentleman's cane, isn't it? With the beautiful polished brass on the handle. Yes, but Mr. Holmes is right. It's not the sort of handle you usually see on a cane. Perhaps it's the latest London fashion. And that's just guesswork, of course. Perhaps you could adopt a cane, Mr. Nerahodo. Might rather suit you. I have a feeling it might argue with the sword around my waist. That's all we got. Nothing about the AG yet. Okay, that's going to be later then. Oh. Look at all the scribbled notes on the back of the flyer here. I don't believe it. What is it? Listen to what it says. Name, Gina Lestrade, height 5 foot 2. Green cap, scruffy waistcoat, scruffy white shirt, blue satchel. 
Ragged. It's a detailed description of Miss Lestrade. Goodness. Even a sketch of her, hat and all. Although, if he showed it to her, he'd fire that smoke grenade launcher at his face for sure. And look, the details of this shop have been written down here too. Windybank's Pawn Brokery, Baker Street, Redemption. Deadline, 15th of April. Which is today's date. Why would Mr. Bendig have all that information scored on the back of the piece of paper? That's clearly what we're after though, isn't it? Clearly. Take that! Yes. What brought you to this shop in the first place is the info about Miss Lestrade. Quite so, my dear fellow. It would appear that the writing and sketch on the reverse of the flyer pertain to the pickpocket Miss Lestrade and to Mr. Windybank's pawn brokery here. Uh -huh. You originally told us that you had merely given chase after Miss Lestrade stole the redemption ticket from you. But that, sir, is a thinly veiled lie. It is the information on the back of the flyer that led you here today. By which I mean... Here, to Windybacks Pawnbrokery today, the redemption deadline of that overcoat. So, you waited outside for the young girl, matching the description you have written down to arrive. Hmm. Huh. And you have gone to some lengths to hide the reason for your pursuit of Miss Lestrade. In other words, there is some ulterior motive for your actions. The cane which you unwittingly clutch to your person exhibits an incontrovertible contradiction. Sort of rot. I've, I've had this cane for years. The contradiction of which I speak is, of course, the missing Firu. Yeah, not that. No. It's, that, it's, it's the AG. Um, what's a Firu? It's the metal cap commonly found at the end of a cane, Mr. Narahodo. Yeah, the bit that makes the nice clacking sound on the pavement. Yes, exactly. Mr. Schlomes is right. It appears to be missing on this cane. But it doesn't actually look broken, does it? No, it doesn't. The little gentleman certainly did recoil when Mr. Schlomes identified the cane as suspicious. In other words, there's something secret about the cane that Mr. Benedict would rather we don't know. It's, it, it's like, is there anything else to investigate around here right now? Just looking around the room, just seeing if there's anything else. Hmm. Don't think so. And why is my throat doing that? Oh, that was weird. Suppose we could look at the stylish hat. As stylish as is, no doubt it is. Don't think this white top hat suits the man, do you? No, not at all. The more I look at it, the more something strikes me as suspicious about it. And perhaps... It's not so much that it strikes you as suspicious, but rather that the hat is just striking. I, I suppose you're probably right. Uh, perhaps the hat isn't what we're looking for. Probably something hidden under it. But it is like, it is the AG we want. I'm just wondering if there's anything else. Alright, AG it is. Look here, Miss Suzato. There are some letters on the handle. Ah, yes. Those must be initials, I think. In the West, it's customary for people to engrave their belongings with the first letters of their names. So Herlock Schlomes would be H.S., you mean. That's right. Initials on this cane, obviously. Oh. A.G. Why does it feel as though that's not quite right? It's like, yep, it's gotta be. There's nothing else on the other side, is there? No. Okay, it's gotta, it's gotta be that. Take that! The contradiction of which I speak is, of course, the initialing. A most astute observation, wouldn't you say, Mr. Eggert Benedict? We are led to believe, sir, that your initials are EB. Yet in a most possessive manner, you have in your grasp a cane bearing initials A.G. An incontrovertible contradiction indeed. Would you not agree? No, you, you're wrong. 
This cane isn't... You said before that you had the cane for years. So don't try to tell us that you just borrowed it from a friend or found it in the park. In short, though you hold yourself to be a gentleman, you have withheld your true name. What just ripped? You recoil, sir. Is something wrong? I, well, I. And in your recording, you inadvertently facilitate the answer of the next conundrum to present itself. Namely, what is the truth behind this rod you bear? Yes, your reaction betrays the truth. The handle, which you evidently would like to conceal, is the key to understanding this riddle you see. Let's consider the bare bones of what's happened here. Miss Lestrade redeemed the fine-looking overcoat. Now a mysterious man has appeared introducing himself with a fake name, claiming that the overcoat belongs to him. But we know that he actually identified Miss Lestrade from a written description, which suggests that everything else he's told us isn't true. So what we need to do here is somehow prove that the overcoat cannot possibly belong to him. He just tore it, didn't he? So it's not his size. That's what the that's what the rip sound was. So ah, uh, there it is. Look, there it is. Oh, I see him on the shoulder. There, it's coming apart. Look. So it is. Do you know a moment ago when Mr. Benedict was surprised by something that was said? I thought I heard him make a rather strange noise. It sounded a bit like a tiny growl. Now I think it was probably the sound of his seam ripping open. Look closely, it does seem to be a very tight fit. Sleeves are stretched to bursting, and he wouldn't have a hope of fastening it at the front. If he were to run around in it, I'm sure the whole thing would fall apart. Hmm. That I'd like to see. Sorry? So how can we make Mr. Benedict run around? She's really given this some thought. The split seam, which you evidently would like to conceal, is the key to understanding this riddle, you see. Ah. Yes, because the overcoat is rather obviously a poor fit. Having forced it over your broad shoulders, the seam is already breaking apart. My suspicions were aroused from the outset. Were they now? When you so boldly lied about your name and so boldly waylaid this pickpocket. Ah. This catalogue of untruths has all been for one very specific purpose. To steal the article that the young girl redeemed from Mr. Windybank. Ah. Oh god. But what really irks me is this. The considerable crime I initially imagined has been considerably curtailed. To have scone with a redeemed item. Oh my. How could he? Yeah, so this is going to be completely obvious. Just, he's after the disc. Really, isn't he? But why? What's so specific about the disc is my question. Now, Mr. Benedict, let us continue. We must expose the details of this elaborate crime you have in the planning. This is utterly absurd. You're suggesting that I, a gentleman, designed a wheeze to filch some tawdry article of pawnage. Have you forgotten that I redeemed the article in the proper manner using the watchword? Had I not been the one to deposit in the first place, how could I possibly have known the relevant details? Ne sais pas. No, but the watchword can be discovered. As you are only too well aware, Mr. Benedict. Oh, and your furtive glance is more telling than I would have hoped. What? Let's consider how one might come to learn a secret watchword relating to the pawn property of another. 
The method is revealed by the council notice on the counter of which your eyes were inadvertently drawn. The direction of the deduction must change rather dramatically now, I think. Yes, no more talk of tunneling into the sewers. Which is a pity, because it all sounded rather exciting. Anyway. Can't deny that this mysterious gentleman did know the watchword. Yes, Professor. I didn't know that word. Mr. Windybank would never allow you to redeem the article. Or, looking at it another way, if you did know that word, Mr. Windybank would allow you to redeem the article whether it was yours or not. The question is, this gentleman have found the watchword out somehow? I mean, what we got on here? The old lamp? I don't think it's going to be the old lamp. It's got to be that, isn't it? The no the notelet. It's got to be. Look at this, Miss Suzato. Ah, it appears to be a memo that Mr. Windybank has scribbled to himself. Let's see, what does it say? Oh! Professor. Yeah, it, it, it says more than that, though. Mr. Windybank must have made a note of the watchwords his customers give him. Right before their eyes. And in alarmingly clear script as well. Oh dear, I, I don't know where to look. Who knows what other secrets I might see. Oh, that's it then. Take that! The method is revealed by the notelet on the counter to which your eyes were inadvertently drawn. Yes, the broker here follows the same procedure whenever a customer comes to redeem an article. He asks the customers for the watchword, and notes down the response uttered on a notelet he has to hand. Then he consults his ledger, and confirms whether or not the watchword matches that of the article in question. I would expect nothing less of a diligent pawnbroker. But his diligence clearly has its disadvantages. What are you talking about? It is increasingly apparent that you were present in this shop before your accusation against Miss Lestrade. In all likelihood, you followed her inside and then observed her talking to Mr. Windybank. When the diligent broker made a note of the watchword, as is his common practice, you observed him writing the word Professor on the notelet beside the ledger. And that, sir, was the master plan you devised to steal the pawned article from the young Miss Lestrade. M master plan? Which brings us, at last, to the final chapter of this lurid scheme. Why would you go to such lengths to redeem that particular article from this pawnbroker? Are you quite serious? An ill-fitting overcoat hardly seems to justify the effort, much less a worthless music box disc. But naturally, you had very good reason to make them yours, didn't you, Mr. Benedict? I have no idea what you're talking about. Allow me to present a rather interesting piece of evidence. You see, this picture postcard tells us all we need to know. No, even though it is interesting. The articles we're talking about are the overcoat and the music box disc that was in one of the pockets. Which, according to Mr. Windybank, isn't even worth a penny. And yet this man went to such lengths to steal them. Why? I wonder if perhaps we already have the evidence we need to explain it, Mr. Narahoda. Could we? Really, I'd better have a thorough look for all the evidence we've collected so far. We've only got the disc, so it's got to be the thing on the back, isn't it? It's got to be that. What else could it be? For Mick Gilded. The surname of the man whose innocence you secured in trial two months ago, Mr. Narahodo. Yes, a trial I'll never forget. Not least because of the tragic accident that followed in which Mr. Mick Gilded was killed. Why would his name be on this music box disc? I'm afraid I have absolutely no idea. But one thing seems certain. This surely cannot be a simple coincidence. 
Like, can you even see the note on the other side? This is the thing, like, the note covers a hole here. It should be that hole there, and you can't see it on this side. It's just weird. So wait, do we just present this? I don't know, I feel... I feel like the only thing I can think of in regards to, like, what they're pointing out with the possessions and stuff, so... I mean, it's updated, isn't it? So they should present it. Take that! You see? This music box of discs tells us all we need to know. What's that? On the back? It reads for McGilded. Ah. Ah, Mr. Magnus McGilded. The unfortunate philanthropist who perished in curious circumstances at the Old Bailey two months ago. A prominent man in London. For his lone mongering demonstrated a distinct lack of scruples. So, you're an associate of his, are you? Or perhaps a subordinate? Mr. McGilded was a man of unusually small stature. In fact... It was precisely the right size for that overcoat that you squeezed yourself into. Ooh, I... Your true identity remains shrouded in mystery. Mr. Egret Benedict. Eckert. Keep doing the Egret. Eckert Benedict. But the final conclusion here is crystal clear. The reason you came to this pawn brokery today... was to retrieve an article left behind by the late Magnus McGilded. Ah, <laughs> and such. <laughs> to acquire an item deposited by Mr. McGilded. Elementary! And such. Well, Mr. Magnus McGilded. What's the name I expected to hear in these circumstances? Mr. Schlomes, uh, I'm afraid there's something very troubling on my mind. Pray tell, Miss Susita. Well, according to what M Mr. Windybank told us earlier, today was the final day on which the coat could have been redeemed, was it not? Yes, ma'am. Uh, that is correct. Uh, today would be precisely two months since it was first deposited. Well, today is 15th of April, so two months ago today... It would have been 15th of February, sir. That's right. It's all carefully recorded in my ledger. Deposited at 10.30pm, I see. What? But, but that suggests... Yes, 15th of February. It's precisely the day which the omnibus murder took place. At half past ten in the evening. Precisely the time at which the terrible events were unfolding. Suggestive is not the word. It would seem the matter is entirely beyond coincidence. You are, of course, at liberty to make whatever outlandish deductions you choose. However... So you're connected to that case. Okay. When did you get that? I must insist you hand over the music box disc now. It would be a terrible shame for you to return to your native land in a box. What do I do? Um, absolutely not. I want to see what happens. There are some things a man must protect, at all costs. This may well be one of those things. Then again, it may not. Hold it! Hold it! Mr. Windybank, this is my shop. I can't allow any harm to come to my customers. If that were to happen, I should have to take my own life. Mr. Windybank, no. All right, that's enough. Well, 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 what's all this then? Inspector Gregson. Inspector. 
That's right, Sunshine. The alarm was raised on one of our dedicated emergency lines. So we got here as fast as we could. Now, what's all this about, eh? Oh, praise be. Got here at last. I was moments away from forfeiting my own life in my very own establishment. It would seem you have the upper hand. Alright, you lot have got some explaining to do. I don't appreciate being bothered with some petty argy bargy. Argy bargy? Petty? Mr. Windbank finally nearly met his, with his end! Yeah, by his own gun, as far as I can tell. Oh dear. And the whole of Britain could meet with its end if I don't get to the bottom of this case I'm supposed to be working on. What? What on earth is this case, Inspector? Spare no detail, Gregson. I... I might have said a little too much. No matter, it's nothing to do with you lot. I want to know about that. Anyway, sir, you're going to have to come with me to the station. But of course, Inspector. Why? He's getting away! Good afternoon, lads. What's the beat officer too? Sir! Is the beat officer going to be beat? There's been a spate of thefts at pawn shops around here recently. So we've fitted emergency buttons underneath the counters for brokers to let us know when there's trouble. Oh, Inspector, I was very worried there for a while. Very worried indeed. Now then, Mr. Permanently in morning. Oh, yes. I'll be taking that whatever it is of McGilded's down to the yard, thank you very much. Send it over. Oh, yes, of course. No, don't! Don't give it to him. It's mine, that is. I'm sorry, miss. But anything belonging to me gilded has to be taken in as evidence now. As evidence? If the police demand something as evidence, my dear fellow, we have no choice but to capitulate. It's all yours, Inspector. And so, we hand over Mr. McGilded's desk over to Inspector Gregson. And we're summarily turfed out of the shop and onto the street. To be continued? What? 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 What I say? What? What? But you. I'm trying to put on an especially posh accent for some of these characters. It's like... Difficult. 15th of April, Baker Street. See? That's why I hate grown-ups. All they do is feed you a pack of lies and take stuff away from you. Oh, really, Miss Lestrade? Tell me, is that overcoat keeping you warm? What? Oh my, surely you were given that. Yeah, the... the D let me keep it. After I looked daggers at him long for long enough. Jeez. He went through the pockets and they said, go on then, have it, before telling me to scarper. It always pays off giving people a look like you ate them. I can't help feeling that it's going to get you into serious trouble one day. What I really wanted was that nice shiny disc, mine. The music box disc. Mr. Windybank said it was practically worthless. I think I'm gonna go and have another bash. Give him a long, hard stare. I think not, Miss Lestrade. We shan't enter Windybucks again today. Why not? It's not fair. It can't be helped, I'm afraid. The police are investigating the scene now and taking a statement from Mr. Windybank. But that is mine. I had the ticket for this coat and it was in the coat's pocket. There should be something else and all. That's what the Rotten Cove said, ain't it? Yes, he did mention something about another article, didn't he? Well then, that's mine too! Whatever it is. Now oh, she's really pushing her luck. 
Miss Lestrade, I think it's time to admit defeat. You've had your haul for today. Yeah, and it's all your fault, Shlomes. So what are your plans now? You dine with us this evening? Eh? Iris would be delighted to cook, I'm sure. And I might entertain you with a modest violin recital. Nota. Oh. Why would I come round your place, eh? You lost your head or something? And she's gone. Oh, dear, she's gone. Hmm. Having reviled on me quite unnecessarily, I might add. I can't help wondering. Perhaps she might turn up anyway. Interesting. Once she's had a chance to calm down, then there's a good chance she'll decide to come. Very well then. I'll inform Iris to set a place for our potential guests at the dinner table this evening. And one more thing. I should be glad of your company later too. Sorry? I believe I will have a rather splendid surprise to show you. Oh, how exciting. What is it? You shall have to wait and see, Miss Susito. Until later then. Alright, so we got anything else to examine? This closed shop is intriguing me. I feel like it's going to be relevant at some point. Hmm. But especially because it's like, when you think about it, there is a door in there that lines up with this wall. So the door in there goes into this shop, doesn't it? So I feel like that's going to be relevant somehow. You can't go back in. Like, there, you can see it on that wall. That wall corresponds with the wall outside, so that door there leads into the other shop. Why would you have that? Very strange. Fifteenth of April, three forty six PM. Shlomes is sweet. Hmm. Ah, Susie and Runo. Come in, come in. Good afternoon, Iris. Thank you so much for breakfast this morning. Oh, don't mention it. Goodness, look at the time already. Busy as always. I am. I'm preparing everything for dinner this evening. Already? You're obviously cooking something special, are you? Oh, yes, after all, we have a special guest joining us. Guess who it is? Go on. <laughs> You'll never guess. Um... Those little eyes of hers shining. Oh dear. It is awkward when you already know the answer, isn't it? It's Ginny! Isn't that exciting? Oh, oh, what a surprise! Yes, that's wonderful news! Oh, Iris seems overjoyed at the idea. I can't wait to learn some pickpocketing tips from a real professional. Oh, yes, that does sound like fun. I'm not sure that's entirely appropriate. Are you Mr. Norahodo? Uh, uh, by the way, Iris, uh, what's Mr. Shlomes up to? Hurley? Oh, he's been like that ever since he got back. Hello, Mr. Shlomes. I beg that you won't speak to me. Sorry? I don't know who you are, but kindly take your leave. As you can see, I am not here. I... I don't know how to respond to that. I do apologize. When he gets like this, he's completely oblivious to everything. Yes. I see. Really, he behaves just like a child sometimes. Hurley does. Mr. Schlums and Iris have something of a parent and child relationship, don't they? Yeah, but I'm sure Ryu here will probably agree with me. Like, which way is it? Yes, except that Iris is clearly the parent here. Yep. Come to think of it. I wonder where her real parents are. What's the matter, Runa? You have ever such a funny look on your face. Oh, no, it's nothing. I know what it is. Why does this girl live here, Mr. Shlomes? You're wondering? Am I right? How, how did you... 
Mm, oh, Bruno, I can read you like a book. Mm, this girl is dangerous. Don't worry, you can ask me anything. I won't mind. When you say that, but I just want to investigate something over here first, like... No, I can't investigate that. It, it, it looks like like this duck or something like that. Or a paper duck is there in the bin. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm thinking, actually, we'll probably end this part here. After we just inspect him. Because it's like, it's like, hold on, what's going on here? So, Mr. Schlobes, what are you so engrossed in? Did you not hear? I am not here. Oh, of course you're not. I think why the whole bed of the ocean is not one solid mass of oysters. So prolific the creatures seem. Ah, you won't even turn around and look at me. It's best just to leave him alone when he's in one of his moods like this. Yes, I can see that. Alright then, yeah, so we'll end this part here and the next part we'll speak to Iris and see what's going on. Ta-da for now.